This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less taxes. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So, data, big data, little data, all data. Data is the it, it is that four letter word that we use. Um, and the question is, how can we use it? How can we actually use data to our benefit with our clients, with our customers, with our um, even our vendors, with our employees? How do we actually gather big data? How do we use big data? And we have an expert on big data, uh, Seth Stevens Davidowitz who wrote the book, Don't Trust Your Gut, Using Data to Get What You Really Want in Life. And Seth, it is great having you on the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. And so, uh, Seth, if you would, just give us a little bit about your background, because I know you go, uh, you, you, you've been deep into Google and done some other cool things from a data standpoint. Yeah, so I, I did a PhD in economics, and basically all economists one day decided they were just going to call themselves data scientists. Because uh, data scientist sounds cooler than economist. And really, when you're trained as an economist, you learn how to make sense of data, how to do regression analysis, sometimes machine learning. So then I got a job at Google as a data scientist. And uh, for the last five years or so, I've been a writer. I wrote a book, Everybody Lies, about all the things you could learn about people from Google Trends, which is a tool that a lot of people didn't know about, uh, and really, really powerful tool. And then uh, this new book, Don't Trust Your Gut, is about how you can make better decisions in all arenas of life uh, by using data. I kind of call it money ball for your life. Uh, so I'm yeah. a huge baseball fan. And uh, you if you're a baseball fan, what? Yeah, Again. there you go. I, I, money, money ball. The, what, yeah, what, yeah. What, so it's like the obvious, if you're a baseball fan, it's pretty obvious that the game's totally different right. than when I was a kid growing up. There were no infield shifts. Now there are a ton of infield shifts, so they're banning the infield shift. In, uh, but... There, you know, the game was just, you know, was singles and bunts and steals, and now it's home runs and strikeouts. Just a totally different game, all sure. based on these patterns that have been discovered in data. And it kind of occurred to me that when we make our big decisions in life, we don't really, we're, we feel, I feel like we're in the pre money ball days of mm -hmm. big life decisions. So dating or career or happiness. And that's, I, I feel like we're ready to start changing that because just as there is so much data on the game of baseball that allowed for this saber metrics revolution there's now so much data on all the big questions of life uh, including the ones you talk about how to be richer and uh there's just there's just a, an explosion of data and uh, so i, I kind of went through a lot of the best studies that i could find on these big topics that i think a lot of people would say aren't really decisions you make with data they're decisions you would trust your gut and uh and I'm like, well, actually, now we can start move towards an. We can start. We're starting to move towards a world where you actually could approach these decisions using data. Interesting. So I, I was, uh, I was listening to Gary Keller, Keller Williams, uh, recently, and he said, you know, you should always be able to predict what your outcomes are. And um, so, you know, it should never be a surprise what your sales are, you know, what's going to happen in the future. You should always be able to predict that. And, you know, a lot of that comes from, da from data. What, what's interesting to me is you've actually been able to use a lot of tax data that you've gathered. Um, and my question is, first of all, how'd you get the data? What well, kind of data are you talking about? And, and, and really, are, are you talking about, you know, because you talk about trends, I presume you're not talking about personal data like Facebook was accused of, of uh, using. Yeah, so the tax data, it's, so I didn't actually analyze the data. I analyzed the charts in the appendix. Uh, so the data, to get data, there's a rigorous process and you have to go through a million hoops and uh, that researchers, you know, professors go through. Uh, and it's all de-identified, anonymous, aggregated data. But there are all these trends that, uh, you know, it, I've kind of found, you, you say, how can you make sense of all this data out there? And a lot of the juicy stuff's in the appendix of papers, because academics are always trying to make an intellectual point or a theoretical point. Uh, so there's a paper I talk about capitalists in the 21st century. And it's an amazing paper where they analyze the complete universe of 
uh, tax records, again, yeah, as you're saying, totally anonymous. Uh, and they say, uh, and they analyze who's a member of the top 1%, the top 0.1%. People are earning, uh, you know, in many cases, millions of dollars a year. And it was a, it was a very subtle paper with a lot of theory about human capital versus uh, other forms of capital. And, but they have this appendix where they just list all the fields, how many millionaires they're creating uh, of different fields, different business fields. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's amazing. It was, it was in an online appendix. The research, I, I'm a friend with one of the researchers, so he kind of alerted me to this. And you can compare that to actual data on how many businesses form. And you can see certain fields in the United States just create way higher percent of millionaires than other fields. Uh, and, you know, some of them are kind of obvious, real estate or investing. Sure. Uh, we kind of know them. And then, but some of the fields, middlemen are, can, tends to be a really good field. Mm -hmm. Auto dealerships. Some people knew auto dealerships. I personally hadn't known how good auto dealerships were as a field. Uh, and market research seems to be a really good field. And it's, it's like, oh, wow, there's all these, these patterns. And I think as in business, uh, so, so one of the big things that you see in the tax data is the value of owning versus being a salaried employee. So right, as right. you get higher and higher up the income uh, distribution, the percent of people who are employees just falls off a cliff. So, you know, people making in the top 10 percent, making the top 5 percent, they, they're a big percent of them are employees. They're given their W-2 form and they're paid their salary. But the ones who start going to the 1%, let alone the 0.1%, you just start seeing business, business, business is owning, owning, owning is dominated. Uh, yeah, so- Which I think isn't- I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, which I think isn't that shocking, kind of the value of owning. But then I think people, even people who know you want to own a business if you want to get rich, they don't quite think through- how much variation there is mm. in the chances by a business and that a lot of businesses. So you, when you study economics, the first law of, of, uh, when they, when they teach you about business, they have, they teach you something called the zero profit condition, which is basically businesses can't make profits because if you're making a profit, someone else is just going to start a competing business and charge a lower price until your profit is eaten away. And when you look at the data, it's kind of true in that most businesses aren't creating a lot of rich people because you're just stuck in horrible price competition. Right. So you open up an auto repair shop, you've, you, you're owning your business, you own your time, but there's nothing stopping someone from starting an auto repair shop down the street from you and charging a lower price. You're, you're stuck in ruthless competition. Same with you know, building, equi building equipment, contractor, there's just all these businesses, you actually do the math, preparing the appendix chart to the business chart that fewer than, you know, 2% of people are entering the top 1%. So not many people, let alone, and like, and pretty much nobody's entering the top 0.1%. Nobody's making millions of dollars from these businesses. But then there are these few businesses where they have some way to escape that ruthless price competition and they can charge a premium for their, their service where a lot of people are getting rich and, just kind of that mindset of uh, one, of one, you need to start a business and two, you need some sort of moat around your business and how are you going to get it? Just those, if, if anybody asked those two simple questions, I think their chances of getting rich would go from about, you know, the average chance, the average person has a 0.1% chance of entering the top 0.1%. I think if you just ask yourself those two questions, you'd have a, Right. 10%. So, so, so give it those, give us those two questions again. Well, actually there are three questions. I should say, actually three questions. There's one, do you own something <laughs> Two, Are you going to avoid, how are you going to build a moat around your business so that someone's not destroying you on price competition? And there's a third one actually, which is how are you going to avoid global behemoth putting you out of business? Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you start a sneaker business, you can build a moat around your brand. Uh, you can have athletes advertising your sneaker. But I wouldn't recommend someone start a new sneaker business because how are you going to compete against Nike and Adidas yeah. and uh, Reebok, the ones who have really been set up for years and have all the relationships with athletes? Look, 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 look at Tesla. It took 100 years from yeah. when Chrysler was formed to a second successful automaker in the US, which was Tesla, a hundred years it took. So that's how hard it is 
to compete against those big guys. So it, this, this is a really interesting to me. So, um, cause you, you talk about the, 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 t- the owning versus, versus <laughs> being an employee, because this is something I talk about. So, uh, what, basically what I tell people is the more money you make, the more taxes you pay, but the more assets you own, the less taxes you pay. So, and and what I'm hearing is, is I think the data would, would prove this out. But let me give you an example. And you can tell me where would you actually go to get real data on this? So I I just wrote a book and it's just coming out. It's uh, on pre-order right now. The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. And what I do is I look at those types of investments that you own that provide both a high rate of return to you and to the government, as well as lowering your taxes. Okay. So when you look at something like that, and, and this is where the top 0.1% come in, because they always do this. Okay. This is how the rich don't pay taxes, basically, is what this book is, how the rich don't pay taxes. And they, they're doing it legally. They're doing it really the way the government wants them to do. But how, where, where would you actually go to, to say, well, okay, I've, I've used simple examples. Where would you go for to say, well, here's the data to to sh- to prove that? Yeah, so you have to know your way around Google Scholar, uh, which is put. That's one of those things. Putting a little energy into understanding Google Scholar probably goes a long way. It's it's one of those pain pain in the ass things to do when you're starting, but once you do it, you can actually. There's usually a paper that's been written on this. Because tax data has been made available to research, again, a totally anonymous, aggregated, right. there's usually a paper written, you know, capitalist in the 21st century is the paper. If you want to know what businesses are creating a lot of millionaires, the appendix of capitalist in the 21st century is the huh. paper. There's no other paper uh, that comes close to delivering that type of information. And you know, that's not a question that I particularly uh, looked at, but I think, I, I think you're right that uh, one of the things in, in writing my book, Don't Trust Your Gut, is I want to just encourage people this data-based mindset. So I, I talked this as a, a separate example and get back to wealth and taxes and everything in a bit, but it just shows the mindset is I talk about this guy, Patrick O'Rourke, and he was, I think, a CPA. He was a certified public accountant, and his son was a, a talented baseball player, but he wasn't a great baseball player. He wasn't going to be you know, the great, necessarily the greatest baseball player, and all his friends uh, or it wasn't clear how good he was going to be. And all his friends said, you know, your son should play lacrosse, not baseball, because lacrosse, so many fewer people try it that you just have a much higher chance of getting a college scholarship. And what Patrick O'Rourke said is we live in the 21st century. Statements such as that can be tested. And he Googled around the internet and started looking into information of how many scholarships there are and how many high school players there were for every sport. And I showed the chart that was created based on this. He has a website, scholarshipstats.com, that has all this information. And he found out that what his friends were t- telling him was actually wrong. Yes, there definitely are fewer high school lacrosse players, but there, there are so many fewer college scholarships that actually the ratio of high school players to college scholarships is higher in lacrosse than baseball. Baseball, you actually have, the, you have a high, the percent of high school players who get a college scholarship is higher in baseball than it is in lacrosse, which is the exact opposite of what his friends were telling him. And that kind of mindset, I just want people to be in the in the in that mindset. Sure. And 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 what uh, the way to do it is being good at Google and being good at Google <laughs> Scholar. But ta- uh, Patrick O'Rourke wasn't a trained uh, data scientist. But so, so there are two things you do. There's either you look it up and somebody has already done this. So that's what I did for my book on the best way to get a college scholarship. Right. I, I just said, here's the stats from, Tom, from Patrick O'Rourke that you might not know and, you know the, and showed the table and pointed people to that website. So that's one way. It's in some ways an underrated life strategy because I think a lot of people want to do everything themselves, reinvent right. the wheel. And you don't need to do a study yourself if it's already been done. You just need to point people to this to the study or point yourself to that study. So that's that's always the first thing you do is just Google and see if anyone's done this. And the second thing you do is if someone doesn't hasn't done it, is that data is it possible uh, to collect that data? Which sometimes it is. Uh, you know, so scholar. So if you're looking for scholarships, think about it. Then go. Okay. Well, there's no. Is there information on how many scholarships there are in different sports? And if there isn't, who would I talk to who might have that information? 
Uh, you know, I did a study in my book. I wanted to know what sports were most dominated by genetics. So I wanted to see how many twins, the, the way you know it's like very genetic is they're just a ton of identical twins. Right. Uh, and I just reached out. There's an Olympic historian, Bill Mallon, who's been collecting data on twins in sports, uh, in, in, in Olympic sports. And I just emailed him and he gave me the data and I could do the analysis. So that kind of mindset is what I want people to get in is just, if someone says something, is there, is, is that, just, is there data that could potentially test that hypothesis? And sometimes you're going to find as Patrick O'Rourke did, oh, that hypothesis is actually completely wrong. Uh, it's like the opposite. If my son was a lacrosse player, try to turn him into a baseball player. I, I like that. So I, I have a, a, a specific question for you. So um, one of the big uh, uh, FinTech companies is Intuit, right? And Intuit owns TurboTax, Intuit owns Rocket Mortgage, Intuit owns QuickBooks. And um, particularly TurboTax, uh, it would appear that they've used data from TurboTax to drive Rocket Mortgage. And so my question is, is are they, are they, you know, what are you allowed to do as far as when, if you have, a, a, let's say you have a lot of ways to gather data. Okay, so let's say you've got access to data. Um, what are you actually allowed to use? I mean, what could Intuit use? Obviously, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't target those specific, I mean, I would hope they couldn't target those specific um, taxpayers uh, for Rocket Mortgage, but maybe they did. I, I, I don't know, but I know that it built Rocket Mortgage was their data from, um, from uh, TurboTax. Well, I would caution everybody, I am not a lawyer. And I just, I recommend people look at where data is available. But as far as the legal questions, if it's your business, you need to talk to a lawyer about that. I don't know. There definitely have been examples of companies. Uh, I think Google at some point decided, uh, I think Sergey Brin, there's a story that Sergey Brin at some point said, uh, we could just be the world's greatest hedge funds because we know what everybody's searching. Uh, we could figure out, you know, the seconds before some people buy a stock. And I, I, I think this story, I, I forget where I heard this story. I don't know if it's if it's 100 percent true, but that Eric Schmidt said that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. And that is completely illegal. Uh, you're not allowed to use your data to trade as a, a hedge fund. So, uh, you know, th that's those are separate questions. So, so, it, so sometimes so, so basically what I'm hearing is sometimes it appears that they're they're using that and they may not at all it may just be that they're getting data other places or they're just using yeah. more generic data I, I, for example they would have a customer base they'd be able to use their customer base data to market those customers there certainly would be nothing illegal about that and they could if, if somebody you know gets a tax return then you market to them for a mortgage i mean to me that makes total sense um but there but there is data i guess my question is besides going and getting data from somebody else and going to google scholar where would a typical business owner get uh, data that would drive business decisions? Yeah, so a lot of it is their own data. So something like Google Analytics would be really huge, customer lists, uh, keeping more data. So so many, one thing that's very interesting is when I wrote my first book, some, a bunch of businesses reached out to me to ask me to consult. And every single business told me the same thing we're embarrassed to show you how poor our data skills and data collection efforts are. And I'm like, if every business is telling me that, then they shouldn't all be embarrassed because if anything, they should be less <laughs> embarrassed that they actually reached out to someone and are now trying to correct this problem. Uh, but I think everybody kind of as you do, I, I, people suspect that other businesses are more advanced in data than they probably are. I, I'd even question whether Rocket Mortgage and Intuit are quite as advanced as, they're made, as you might suspect they are. And sometimes it's the simple things uh, just put, give you a huge leg up, uh, which is, you know, <laughs> that was kind of the big, I kind of had this insight when I was writing my book. I'm like, initially I wanted to, I thought I need to blow everybody away with, you know, new studies that I did that, no, that nobody would believe were even possible. And I'm like, wait, I could just, tell people about studies they probably don't know about because the average person just doesn't realize how many amazing studies have been already been done uh, that are useful to you as you're making decisions. You know, the appendix is, the appendix is these tables. Did you know the, the business, the actual businesses that made, uh, created the most millionaires and, and things of that nature. So 
Uh, but as far as an actual business, the one thing I would recommend is just keep way more data uh, than you actually, that, that, just keep everything, try to turn everything into more data questions. And there are tools that, uh, you know, I, in my first book, I talked a lot about A-B testing, uh, which mm -hmm. that's a huge tool of big tech companies. So Facebook or Google or Netflix, when they're deciding whether to make a change to their website, they show the current version to a small group of users and then they show the different, the potential change to a different user, uh, group of users and they see uh, what effect it has uh, on click-through rates and time spent on the site, uh, whatever they might be interested in, a return visits, and then they only make the change if it has a positive effect. And A-B testing now can be done by smaller companies as well. There are tools you can use like Optimizely uh, that allow any organization to do rapid A-B testing. And that's a, that would give you a huge leg up in designing your website. No, that, that, that makes total sense. I, I, yeah, I, I learned the A-B testing years ago. I was actually speaking uh, to a group on, of course, my, my topic, tax, but they were actually teaching, this was early in the online internet marketing days, and they were talking about A-B tests. I'm going, well, that's, that's pretty cool that you can actually know, okay, what's going to work, what doesn't work, just by doing simple testing like that. Yeah. And then... But I think the thing that's underrated is being entrepreneurial uh, in data uh, as well. So collecting data, that's kind of the Patrick O'Rourke model is let's get data to help answer this question. Uh, in my first book, in Everybody Lies, I talked to the story, Jeff Sater, he's this guy who predicted what racehorses are great. And he found that big left ventricles are massive predictors of horse racing success. That's one of the reasons he was able to predict American Pharaoh would be a great racehorse because he had a huge left ventricle. And you're like, well, how did he do that? He built the world's first EKG to measure the internal organs of hearts. Really? And he tried all these things along the way to do that. And that mindset, I think, is a great mindset. People don't usually connect data with entrepreneurship, uh, but sometimes you do have to be oh. entrepreneurial to get the data. Uh, okay. So if the first step doesn't work, the first step is you just look, has anyone collected a data set of uh, horse of ventricle size? And you know, if somebody's done it, don't redo it. Reach out to them. Uh, can you give it to me? If you're not going to give it for free, can I pay you? Uh, you know, in business, the same thing. Is there a list, a customer list that would be useful for me before I go about trying to create it myself? Let me just see if someone already created it and if they're going to give it, they'd be willing to give it to me or sell it to me. But if that doesn't work, then you got to think, can I be entrepreneurial to create that data? So what I'm hearing is, first thing is, is what questions you want answered? Yeah. Next part is, is somebody already uh, collected that data for you? So you don't have to go yeah. reinvent the wheel. And then third is, well, if they haven't, how do you go ahead and collect that data so that you can get your question answered? Does that make sense? That's totally right. And I think, and the main thing, that, again, and that Patrick or work mindset of don't just accept what people tell you. Because uh, I think most of us in the, who are in the data mindset, if someone says our son should be a lacrosse player because he has a better chance of getting a college scholarship, we just say, oh, did you hear what my friend said? Have you thought of lacrosse? And we'd get him a lacrosse stick and start practicing. We wouldn't say that's actually an old, that's, that's he's, the person is basically making a data statement. They're just, they're, right. there are two variables. There's how many college scholarships there are there, how many high school players there are, and there are two sports, and there are four data points that would answer that question. And he's saying that without any data, just based on what he suspects, and the mindset of, well, there are four data points, and, th and then, so now you know your question, and, you and now it's, okay, if someone collected that data, so you don't reinvent the real, and if someone hasn't collected that data, can I go out, and who, who would have, the how would I go about collecting that data myself? I, I love it. So um, the book is Don't Trust Your Gut, Using Data to Get What You Really Want in Life, uh, not just money, but also other things like uh, um, how do you be happy? How do you raise children who can get a better job? Um, all of those things. We do have all this data. It's all out there. Somebody's collected most of this already for us. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. I love that message, uh, Seth. So, Seth, um, besides the book, where could we go for more information about uh, what you know what you're doing with data? I'm on Twitter, Seth S underscore D. 
Seth S underscore D. Awesome. All right. Seth Stevens Davidowitz and uh, don't trust your gut. Use data. Big fan of uh, using data. And when we get more data, when we actually use that data, um, as Seth suggested, this is how you're going to make way more money and pay way less taxes. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.